Perfect. Um, good afternoon. My name is Michelle Hill. I'm Community Outreach Supervisor for Greater Nevada Credit Union. Thank you for joining us on this recorded presentation. Uh, we would like you to make sure that you put yourselves on mute um, until the question and answer sections and then feel free to unmute at that time. Uh, Greater Nevada is finding a growing need for financial education from our community members. Each month, each month, we will showcase a financial topic that we hope will help our community move forward towards financial wellness. If you are interested in learning about these webinars, please check out our website at gncu.org and search for Greater Financial Wellness Hub. Uh, today's presentation is on first-time home buyer. I would like to introduce your pre presenter, Danielle Kirby. Danielle grew up in Johannesburg, South Africa and earned a degree from the University of San Francisco in industrial organizational psychology. She moved to Northern Nevada in 1994 and became a regional sales manager with a large company. In 2000, Danielle obtained her real estate license and quickly became a top producer. With this background, Danielle understands the intricacies and the importance of real estate purchasing process. She's committed to providing her clients with world-class service and making their purchases or refinance an easy, stress-free process. Danielle enjoys an active lifestyle and has competed in many marathons and triathlons, including the Lake Tahoe Ironman event. She uh, loves the outdoors, travel, and spends time with her husband and two boys. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Um, so we are going to talk about home ownership and what it means to get pre-qualified to purchase a home. And where I'd like to start, um, is that if you take away one thing from here, I'd like you to know that no home, no home purchase is worth being house poor. And this slide really is a two part, um, uh, piece to understand. And when you are looking to purchase a home, typically right now you're renting. And when you rent, you pay your rent payment at the beginning of every month. And then if something goes wrong, you call your landlord. Um, there are no insurance fees to pay. There's no property taxes to pay. Um, there's no things to be fixed. So when looking to get pre-approved for a home, one of the things we want to make sure we're doing is that we're pre-qualifying you to what you can afford. And what that means is, let, let's talk about what house poor means. House poor means that I am working to pay my mortgage. All I'm doing is writing that check every month and I've got nothing left over to go out to dinner, to go on vacation, to go to my weekly Chick-fil-A lunch or whatever your treat might be. We want to make sure that we are pre-qualifying you to get into a home that meets your financial needs in a price range that you're qualified for. So again, one of the things we wanna be careful about in pre-approving pre uh, borrowers is that we are pre-approving them within their means. And it's quite interesting. Um, oftentimes people will come in and they say, all right, what do you think you can pre-qualify me for, Danielle? And, and you know, we take their application and people are very, very, very surprised at how much they can actually qualify for. Now in today's Northern Nevada real estate market, we are seeing that our values are going up. So what we think we can purchase for 300,000, when you actually walk through that home becomes very different and you go, oh, well, Danielle said I was pre-approved up to 385. Let's look at homes for 350. What we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we are figuring out what an affordable house payment is to you, to you personally, because you are the one that has to drive up into that driveway every night and go, I love my home. And I'm so excited to write that mortgage check, right? Because it's, you're, you're essentially creating, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Equity and, and um, 
increasing your financial position in life. And so we don't want to get it to the point where it becomes a strain or a drag. We want you to own the home and not the home to own you. So that's one of the things that you have to stay disciplined to. I know that my comfortable house payment is $1,800 a month, and I don't want to go above that so that you can still have fun in life. So <clears throat> again, we don't want you to be house poor and getting pre-qualified. Um, so what does it take to get pre-qualified? Oh, sorry, the dream of owner, home ownership is just that, ownership. Again, we want you to own the home and not the house to own you. Um, so what are we looking for? Let's talk about the big four, okay? And you can see them up here on the screen. FICO, meaning your credit score, debt to income or your DTI, your loan to value, and how much money you have in the bank. So these are the big four factors that we're gonna take into consideration. Now, FICO, let's talk about credit. Credit is an anomaly. It's one of those things that's very, very difficult to understand. And I'm sure a lot of you use credit monitoring systems like Credit Karma to, to kind of watch your FICO score. Well, one of the things about FICO is mortgage uses the big three credit scores. Number one, from TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. Those are the only credit scoring, uh, credit bureaus that mortgage will accept. And they use a scoring module based off of Fair Isaac. Now I tell you that because there are 69 different credit scoring models, okay? 69. So that's when you, that's why when people come to me and say, hey Danielle, my credit score on Credit Karma is um, 800. And then when I pull their scores, something totally different comes up. It's because Credit Karma uses a personal scoring model, which doesn't mean a thing. Basically, it's not used in any industry for anything. It just is more of what your personal um, spending is, and they're giving you a score based on that. So again, FICO credit score, minimum for purchasing a home is 640. It can go all the way up to 850, so that's, sort of a range of credit, the uh, better your credit score, the better um, interest rates are gonna be available to you because credit, when lenders look for uh, how they're going to lend, one of the biggest factors is risk. How risky is it going to be to lend to this person? So FICO score is, is number one, right? Um, number two, debt to income ratio. This is really interesting and I don't, I, I think that it's uh, very misunderstood. First of all, we take your gross income before taxes, before, you know, you make contributions to your medical insurance, before any 401k contributions. So we take your gross uh, earnings and we say, all right, Let's say you make, I like easy numbers. So let's say you make uh, $5,000 a month and you have a car payment for 4,500 and you have a credit card payment that is 250. So now what is left over? What is left over is 4,250. Debt to income, okay, that a lender is looking for is about, ideal is 35%, but the sweet spot is around 43. So what is left over for a mortgage is 43% of that number, is how we're going to qualify you. And so again, this is when I go back to being disciplined in, in, in staying within, um, you, what is comfortable for you in terms of a house payment because we are not taking into consideration cell phone bills, electricity bills, water bills, 
uh, sewer, trash, all the fun things that come along with owning a home. So those, those are some of the big things to understand. We're taking your gross income, less any revolving or installment debt that you have, and whatever is remaining is we're going to look for 43% of that to go towards your house payment. Um, let's go into loan to value. Loan to value means how much money am I asking the lender for and how much money am I bringing to the table? So in other words, we're talking purchase price versus loan amounts. And then what's left over is a down payment. Again, I like easy numbers. So let's say I'm looking for, I, I'm gonna purchase a home for $100,000 and we have you pre-approved and you only have to put 3% down. So now I'm asking the lender for $97,000. So my loan to value is 97%. This is another factor that we're going to look at in pre-qualifying you because based on your FICO score, is going to be a corresponding interest rate, which then will correspond with your payment and your debt to income ratio. Again, I talk about this all day. I'm sure you have tons of questions and we'll take those here in a second, but these are all the factors that go into creating this package of your pre-approval so you can purchase a home. One of the things about um, loan to value, it, I want to clarify that when purchasing a home, there are, there's a the smallest percentage down for a conventional financing is 3%, okay? That's your down payment. Then there's also a thing called closing costs. And I'll get into this a little bit later, but a good rule of thumb from a real estate um, perspective is to use a 3% number for closing costs. So when you're looking at purchasing a home, the amount for the transaction that you should be having in your head is about 6%. Again, 3% is the minimum down payment for conventional financing, and then 3% for down payment. And then we can talk about, in, in a little while, I'll get into how we can um, use programs to help with that 6%. But those are, they're two separate things. Closing costs are things like inspections, title fees, recording fees, um, home warranties, stuff like that, outside of the actual loan. Okay, then the fourth compensating factor is reserves. How much do you have in the bank in the event something went wrong? So again, I'm going to go back to that example of paying rent. If your water heater explodes, what happens? You call the landlord. When you own a home, when the water heater explodes, you call the plumber. So how much do you have in reserves in the event of an emergency? Um, somebody gets hurt and, and, and can't work for a couple months. What is it that you have to, um, take care of yourself in the event of unforeseen circumstances in life, right? This is, <clears throat> these are all of the factors that as a lender, we take into account. And what you need to remember is, this is how we manage risk. So lenders want to minimize risk. So what does that do? It creates paperwork. So we, um, back in 2010, there was a whole bunch of new regulations and laws um, given to lenders due to the housing crisis. And we now have, we are the most highly regulated industry in the nation. We um, have guidelines that we have to follow. We have things that we have to do. And throughout the transaction, we are consistently going to ask you for paperwork. Um, and, and the reason for that is, is when you come to me and say, hey, Danielle, how do I, you know, here's all my, here's my paycheck stubs, here's my W-2s, here's my bank statements. Um, do you need anything else? Nope, we're good. I don't need anything else right now. 
So then you're going to go out and you're going to start looking for a house. Well, finding that house doesn't just take a, a weekend or even two weekends. Sometimes it can be a three to four month process. So what am I going to do that entire time? I'm going to be asking you for more and more paperwork. Why? The paycheck stubs that you just brought to me are now out of date. So are the bank statements. There are, there, this is a process where we all work together and, and delivering the most complete package to our underwriters helps your loan close in a timely manner. So again, there are <laughs> lots of um, things to consider when getting pre-approved. The other thing I, I want to make sure everyone is very clear on when they are looking for a house and, and they have gotten pre-approved, the most important thing beyond anything else is not to take on any new debt. Don't go buy your appliances and your furniture for that house because Ashley Furniture is having a sale with 0% financing. No new cars. Don't change your jobs and don't quit your job. Those are very, very important because that could completely um, remove your uh, approval from the table. So anyways, I know I've done a lot of talking. Um, who has questions? I know I've given a ton of information. All righty, Danielle. Hi, guys. My name is Saray Helms. I wanted to introduce myself um, as a few of you have probably received emails from me, but we would welcome you guys. If you have questions at this moment, we will be taking question breaks to answer them in the chat. Uh, in uh, if you want to send it to the email, gncufinancialacceleration.net, I put that in the chat. We can answer you, but I do have one that looks like it just came through email. So um, let me see. The difference when between a hard inquiry and a soft inquiry. So I guess related to mortgage, would that be a hard inquiry or a soft inquiry? And can you talk about maybe a little bit of the difference? Absolutely. So so Thank it's you. a hard inquiry. So um a couple things. When you are shopping for a mortgage, um, you get a two-week window. So in other words, if you're out at ABC Mortgage Company and, you know, for whatever reason you want to go look at Greater Nevada and then someone else, you have a two week window where you, you can have your credit pulled to where it's only going to reflect as one hard inquiry. So you are a hard inquiry is when you apply for credit. OK, I am making an application for money. That is a hard inquiry. A soft inquiry is when somebody comes to you and says, I want to, you've been paying your credit card so well, I want to increase your limit. So they're gonna take a look at your credit and, and, and offer, extend more credit to you. When someone's offering you credit, that is considered a soft inquiry. So um, hard inquiries are like, I wanna go buy a car. I apply for a credit card. I'm applying for a mortgage. Those are going to be your hard inquiries. Perfect. Thank you. I think that was really well said. I do have a couple coming through. Um, what if, and I think this is in regards to paperwork, right? We talked about that. Uh, what if we're house hunting and in the middle of house hunting, we get a higher paying job, a better job? So th that, um, what we want to see is that there's no gap number one and number two how long is it for going to take for me to get that updated paycheck stuff or i'm going to need an offer letter that says you know this is what you're going to be making this is how many hours a week you're going to be um getting or working and so that with a letter of explanation i can get through it's not ideal but obviously you're bettering your position so yes i would understand why you would want to make that change um we just don't want to have a gap so um because you know obviously now by making more money your debt to income is going down so it does help you but we just want to make sure there isn't a gap that you're in the same line of work and that you're bettering your position 
That was a great question and great answers because it happens yeah. to us. We hope, uh, you know, you get that better, higher paying job, right? Yeah. All right. Um, a couple of these I think we're going to get to later on in the presentation, but I think this is a great one. How long can we expect the pre-approval process to be? And maybe how long is the, the pre-approval good for? Okay, great questions. Really good questions. So typically, so uh, pre-approval is a two-way street. Um, I can typically get a pre-approval done in about an hour if I have all the necessary documentation, and that is key. So I need to have received those W-2s, those tax statements, and um, your paycheck stubs. Those are the most important things, along with bank statements, for me to be able to, to give a solid pre-approval out because if I don't have any of that information, the pre-approval is basically what? words on a paper it's it's meaningless so i can't really give out a pre-approval until i have the necessary documentation for a very very valid and solid pre-approval the other thing i like to do because again i sold real estate for a long time in today's market i will call the listing agent where you have written the offer and i will say hi mr listing agent or mrs listing agent i have mr and mrs smith they are my customers I pre-approve them and I want you to know what solid borrowers they are. I have all of their documentation. So not only is it just a pre-approval, it is a warm phone call that they know when they get that offer, they've got solid borrowers. Thank you so much. Um, I love this one and it's kind of going into the next one as well. So we talked about reserves and not going out in that pre-approval time and getting furniture and things like that or putting things on our credit. So one is how about small purchases? Do they have a big effect if we're, uh, and I think typically related to credit, right, is what we're worried about. And then, gosh, the opposite side of that, if we have a huge medical procedure that we need to pay for that potential particularly we need to put on credit that may or may not affect our home buying experience, correct? Um, so so there was a lot of questions in there. So um, let me start with the small purchases or going out or things like that. You know, if, if you're continuing to live your life through your home search, you know, you go out to dinner, those are not big things. You know, you go to Target and you buy some sheets or some towels or whatever the case may be, that's really not going to affect things much. What I'm looking for in terms of credit is your minimum monthly payment. I'm not taking your total credit card bill. I'm taking what you owe on a minimum monthly basis. So as long as you're not going out and putting, you know, $5,000 increasing that minimum monthly payment, your pre-approval should still be good, number one. Number two, a large medical procedure, I would always, if you have to get it done, I would urge you not to put it on a credit card, but rather work on a payment plan with the medical professional. You know, that is, if you can negotiate a payment plan with them up front, that is always a better option than putting medical bills on a credit card. And I think that um, I didn't answer a second part of a question in the last question, how long is your pre-approval good for? I say 30 days because 30 days is the, win the picture that you've just given me of paycheck stubs and bank statements. So I say, you know, that pre-approval is good for 30 days. Once I um, need, once you bring me updated documentation, I can issue another one that's good for another 30 days. You know, if if home searches take longer than four months, I'm going to have to rerun your credit um, because your credit expires um, or the, the credit report we have on file expires. But um, you shouldn't have too much of a ding in the event that's happening because we can see that it's your same mortgage company um, uh, pulling your credit. So just remember Thank you. That. You have great <laughs> questions. And I know uh, this is typically when we take most of the time, right? But uh, how about care credit? Do you guys work with care credit? There's a great question. Um, I know care credit is a uh, typically a hard inquiry, but because it's related to medical, uh, is there any kind of does it affect your credit still as the same? As yes, it, it does. So because you are applying to receive 
credit. It is a hard inquiry. I know that CARE Credit is a great tool. A lot of providers will give you interest free financing for a year. Um, so, you know, if you know that you're planning something and you want to, so you have a medical procedure that you have to figure out and you want to get pre approved for a house, what I would say is figure out the medical procedure first. In other words, allow that hard inquiry to hit first. So then when I go to do the pre-approval, it's not something that's coming in after the fact that could um, uh, basically no, like shoot your debt, debt to income ratios off the charts and then you're no longer approved. So have that, if you know it's coming up, take care of that first and then come to me and say, all right, Danielle, this is what I have. These are my payments that I've worked out. Now get me pre-approved. Cause then it's, again, it's solid. Thank you so much. One last question. Thank you for your time, Danielle. I'll it's be my pleasure. sure to put your contact information in the chat, but this is a great one. Um, if you said that shopping for a home can sometimes take months, right? But the pre-approval is usually good for about 30 days. If we need to reapply, does that cost money with Greater Nevada Mortgage to get pre-approved um, if that process takes longer? Awesome question. No. Not at all, no cost at all. And you wouldn't, so if, you're, um, if your house hunt is taking longer than you anticipated, you know, I, that application is, is with me and you don't have to reapply. All we're gonna do is get new documentation. I have people who I get pre-approved, they put their stuff on hold for a couple months and then they come back to me and it's, it's just, getting that wonderful paperwork um, back to me and then reissuing that pre-approval. Pre There's no charge for that at all. Okay, perfect. I see a couple more questions, but Danielle, I'm gonna go ahead and let us continue because I think a few of them will get to your, um, or they may be answered in your next slides. Awesome, great. And and I have, I, I love questions because it helps me um, jog my mind of everything that um, I talk about on a daily basis. So the big question that customers ask, and um, I, I, it's, it's because it's such a buzzword right now specifically is, what is your interest rate? And that, we talked about those big four items, right? Um, debt to income, FICO, loan to value. Well, guess what? All of those factors get compiled and then it becomes not what is my interest rate, it's what is your interest rate because those interest rates are basically um, consistent with the other data. So in other words, if you have a credit score of 780, you're going to have most likely a lower interest rate because there's less less risk to the lender showing that you have that you can pay your bills so the lender is going to say hmm i'm going to offer a rate for someone who has over a 780 credit score here versus someone that might be down at 640. so again it's it's the most misunderstood part of the home loan process um and and we talked about, you know, credit score affects a rate. Well, so does debt to income and loan to value. If I have someone who, you know, um, grandma passed away and left me a little inheritance and I can now put 50% down on my home loan, that is a is a factor that is going to affect an interest rate. In other words, I don't now, I now have a 50% loan to value and not a 97% loan to value. Again, this is risk. Um, I don't want to say it's risk mitigation, but this is how uh, rates are priced um, to, and, and how lenders offer rates, if you will. Um, no interest rate is the same for every borrower. So, you know, three different borrowers can come in to me with, again, let's talk about that big four, FICO, debt to income, and loan to value. And none of them are gonna walk out with the same interest rate because it's all dependent 
specifically on the borrower. Um, so let's talk about how rates are advertised. What mortgage lenders are going to do is they're going to send you a flyer in the mail that says, come talk to us. Our interest rates are 2%. Well, that is dangling a carrot. That is because what do they want you to do? They want you to bite. They want you to walk in their door and say, Mr. ABC Mortgage, pre-qualify me. And they're going to go through the exact same thing we just talked about. They're going to say, oh, so your FICO score is um, 720. The rate we advertise, you need to have an 800. Oh, you only have 10% down? Well, this rate was for someone with a 60% loan to value. So this is how people advertise their rates. They're going to advertise the best rate for almost someone who is, um, I don't want to say untouchable, but um, ha has perfect factors. And so they want you to walk in the door and they're going to go through those big four, four um, uh, uh, big four, DTI, loan to value, FICO, and assets, just like we would here. Um, so anyways, that's how rates are driven. They're driven by risk. So again, what I tell people is what is your rate? That is uh, what we do here when we pre-qualify you. Um, the other thing about rates that are very interesting is that rates in Northern Nevada are going to be very different from Kentucky or Tennessee. They're urban versus rural, and they're also different per county and per state. So again, rates are a really tricky thing. Um, it's it, And again, because it's a buzzword, rates are at their all time low. Well, again, it, there isn't just a rate out there. It is, what is your rate? So, what does locking a rate mean? Locking a rate is exactly that. We're going to watch the market and, you know, believe it or not, we get a rate sheet on an hourly basis. Every hour we get a new rate sheet. So rates can change, not drastically, but can change every hour, every day. Rates are based on what, um, what the 10-year treasury bond is doing in the market. And what does locking a rate mean? It means that we are ready to buy, we are in contract, and we want to watch rates for a couple of days so that we can get the best rate based on our circumstances. So we're going to do exactly that. We're going to take that rate, we're going to put it in a closet, and we're going to lock it up. By locking it, it means if rates go down, your rate is locked. But it protects you if rates go up, especially if we're, we've got a pre-qualification where, you know, if it changes just a little bit, that's going to affect our approval, we want to make sure we lock up that rate. We typically lock rates for purchases around 45 days because a purchase right now takes about that long. Um, the longer you want to extend out that rate, the more expensive that's going to be. So we really, you really want to work hand in hand with your lender when you are um, writing offers to say, hey, Danielle, I'm really excited about this house, we're writing a contract on it, you know, what are rates doing right now? So um, that's why we want to lock our interest rate. We want to make sure that we know what our payment's going to be um, uh, moving forward on that contract that we're writing. So that is how your interest rate is determined as a borrower. Um, so products and processes. I, I touched upon this a little bit earlier in terms of what do I need to have to buy a home? So there are, there are three types of products that um, we, we work with. Conventional governments, which is FHA, VA, and USDA, and Jumbo. So conventional loans, minimum required down is 3%. That's your down payment. Then, of course, you have your closing costs. The maximum conventional loan amount for um, for 2021 here in Washoe County is $548,250. So yes, you can have as little as 3% down on a purchase 
where your loan amount, not your purchase price, but your loan amount is 548.250. If we go into government, FHA, VA, and um, USDA, which is more rural, uh, FHA requires three and a half percent down as your minimum down payment. VA is 100% financing, so um, USDA can also be 100% financing, but the property has to qualify. Jumbo is anything where your loan amount is 548.251 and above. Um, so, and Jumbo gets into um, some more. You, you have to have 20% down for a jumbo loan. There's some more nuances the higher loan amount you go. So there are also programs that we can attach to these products. So like I said, keep in mind, sort of funds for a purchase around 6% for that down payment and those closing costs. Well, Danielle, I have 2%. Is there a way to make up that other 4%? Yes, there is. It's called down payment assistance. And um, those, there are great programs out there. There are grant programs. And we can talk about that, um, uh, get into that a little more later. Um, those are more specific to each person. But what, what I'm doing is when you come to me with all of your documentation, I'm saying, all right, let's look at what is most affordable. I wanna get you the most house for the least payment on a monthly basis. Um, and how are we gonna package this up so that it works for you? How are we gonna get, if we need a down payment assistance, what is that gonna look like? What are the best options based on your specific situation that we, where we can get you pre-approved? And, and this, is, this is what my job is, is to walk you through your options based on all the programs and, and products that are out there. Um, let's see, these are, uh, these are great resources. And I know that um, Soraya is going to give you these um, links to websites, but the down payment assistance programs are home at last rural. So again, the property has to be in a rural area. Believe it or not, parts of Sparks and Parsons City qualify for home at last. Home is possible. Um, is the um, uh, Nevada housing where there is down payment assistance and that's more geared towards Reno. And then home ready is uh, the 3% conventional financing. You only have to have 3% down. So again, these are great links. You can look at um, how much assistance you can get and what the corresponding interest rate would be for that assistance. And this is all things that we can add on to help you purchase, make that first time purchase. Because I know when you're looking at making, um, you know, purchasing for the first time here in Reno, an entry level can sometimes be 400,000. You're talking about $24,000. And that's a lot of money to come up with for the first time. So there, again, there are programs out there to help with that. Um, questions. Again, I've gone through a lot of information. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, we do have a few questions and I, there's a couple that were lingering from last time and I want to start with those to make sure our questions were answered. But the first one were was, are there any programs out there for first time home buyers? But I know we talked about those um, down payment assistance kind of programs, yes. but anything else you wanted to add to that? No, um, you know, there's there are situations where um, in terms of assistance, you can get gift funds. So, you know, if if grandma says, um, hey, you know, I've got little savings accounts for each of my grandchildren and you want yours early um, so you can purchase a home, grandma can gift money to you. Quite frankly, anyone can gift money to you. It's just that it that it's just that it's a gift. It's not expected to be repaid. So that is the other option um, in terms of down down payment assistance is there are, um, you, you can receive part of your down payment as a gift. Beautiful, thank you so much. Um, I think this is a great question. For buyers that are approved for FHA or first time uh, loan, what can the buyers do to then qualify for a conventional loan? So, okay, so 
That that's a great question. So FHA, if FHA is a great product because sometimes their rates can be better if you have a little bit of a lower credit score. That being said, what a good lender is going to do is say, all right, let's look at is FHA a good choice for you or is conventional? Because if you're putting less than 20% down, there's this thing on every mortgage. It's called mortgage insurance. Basically, it just is insurance um, for the lender that you're going to be you're going to be re making your mortgage payments. So anytime you have less than 20% down, you're going to have mortgage insurance on a property. With an FHA um, loan, your mortgage insurance is for the life of the loan. Okay. If you are conventional and you have mortgage insurance, the minute your equity position comes to 22% of your purchase price versus your loan amount, that mortgage insurance goes away. So to go from an FHA to a conventional, you can be pre-approved for FHA, but it's hard to answer that question without knowing the specifics of why did the lender put you into FHA and what are your what are what is your situation specifically and can we fit you into that conventional box so it's just really taking a look at it and it may be that fha is the best route but it's just taking a look at the whole picture yes thank you and i love how you explain that um there's different options but maybe the lender has chosen that the other route is better so it does kind of come down personally to credit score and things like that so yes, um does. and we got into this a little bit uh but somebody said can you tell me what the percentage rate for a down um for conventional again and i think the question is coming in that three percent but you said if it's less than 20 percent, there's that added personal mortgage Mor insurance mortgage insurance and so yes the minimum down payment for conventional financing for a first-time home buyer is three percent and again that's your down payment and then we've got closing costs so total together six percent and how are we going to make that up if you have two percent can we go out and get down payment assistance for that four percent or maybe grandma has 2%, you have 2%, and we only need 2% from down payment assistance. So there are ways to package that 6% up. But down payment, strictly down payment, 3% for conventional financing. Perfect. I think that's all the questions for now, so we can continue on. Thank you, Danielle. Oh, absolutely. Now, um, the next uh, few slides are really and um, some great tools that Greater Nevada um, offers through our website. And um, they're through Everfi and it, they're little tutorials. They're, they're really quick and easy to do. They're um, uh, very helpful because they help answer questions that maybe I didn't get into, but you can kind of go through and say, oh, is this something I should consider now? Or is this something that, you know, maybe I need to clean up my credit a little bit. Maybe I need to, um, I don't know, save a little, you know, save, save a couple more, you know, towards a down payment. Um, there's also um, some community resources out there for helping you with credit counseling. One of the things too that I do with customers is I have had several first time home buyers come to me and, and this one, I, I have an example. One came to me last April and he said to me, he's like, Danielle, I've had a Best Buy credit card since I was 18, but I don't really use it. I want to buy a house. I'm renting. I'm just really tired of it. What do I need to do? And so he came in and we basically sat down, we looked at his credit and we said, all right, this is where you need to get to. This is what you need to do. And he absolutely did everything I told him to do. And by December, he was a homeowner. So um, there are resources out there, but also, you know, your, your mortgage lender should also have resources and tools and, and helpful tips to help you um, get into the position where you can be pre-approved. So we do work in conjunction with these um, uh, uh, partners, Balanced Financial Fitness, 
Cash Course, Everfi. So these are all on our website and resources, great resources for um, first time home buyers to use. Um, anyway, and you know, I appreciate you letting me do this presentation today. Um, and Soraya, are there any other questions? I feel like I might have skipped over a couple topics or not gone too far in depth. Um, really, we can use the rest of the time. This is great for open questions and things like that if we have. And it's fantastic, you guys. Anybody that wants to stay on, once again, um, we are so appreciative that you're able to make it uh, because we know this is your lunch break. But yes, we can take the rest of the time to kind of answer, answer some questions. So I do That's have another one for you. And you guys, please welcome yourselves off of mute. Uh, use the chat or we do have an email if you want to uh, send them in that way as well. Uh, are you able to have the 6%, so that would be the 3% down, 3% closing, and still apply for the programs? Yes. Absolutely. That's a great question. Great question. You can. Just because you have reserves already uh, doesn't preclude you from being able to use those grant programs. It may be that that's not the best option for you, but you can use them. Thank you. And this is a great one. We've been, um, as you've been presenting, excuse us, but we've been chatting away about kind of the local housing market. Um, so I love this question is, what can borrowers do to compete against cash buyers? You know, that is a great question. And um, so, like I said, I, I sold real estate for 20 years. My husband still happens to be a realtor. And these are this is the climate of our current real estate market. And um, when it comes to getting a loan versus having cash, there's a couple of things that are in play there. One is the appraisal. So in our current market, now I'm kind of taking off my lender hat and I'm putting on my real estate hat, but um, one of the things that people are doing is they're saying, I will write this offer for over list price and I will say that if the appraisal comes in low, I'm still going to guarantee you that I'm coming in with the amount of money that's on this contract. And so when you have a loan, that house has to appraise for that contract price. Or let's say that appraisal comes in $20,000 less, you then are on the hook for coming up with that $20,000. Now, that doesn't necessarily answer the question how to compete in this cash market. One of the things that I do again is I call that listing agent and I say, hey, I have pre-qualified these borrowers. They are solid. I feel very good about their approval. Barring any unforeseen circumstances, um, these guys are great to go. When it comes to cash, unfortunately, when you have a loan, you're, you know, you've got to appeal to the seller somehow getting the seller to take your offer over that cash offer. It depends on what's important to the seller. Maybe they want a family in their home and they're not really concerned about the bottom line. Maybe they want, you know, they've been in this home for 40 years. They raise their children in this home and they now want another family in this home. So it really is um, dependent on each situation. So. Well, and I love that because somebody actually put their like, I've heard to write letters yes. um, or include photos and kind of stories to the seller. Um, they asked, I've heard that buyers were, will often write letters to sellers. Does it actually influence? And I think that answers um, that 100%. Question. Thank so, you so much. Yeah, that's all the questions we have for now, but we still have quite a bit of time so we can definitely use this. And yes, um, all of the information, the resources, as well as Danielle's contact information will be sent to you uh, from myself so that you can use all of this later. Another question was, can we get this recording? And yes, you may have noticed that we are recording this. And so we will be posting this on our financial education wellness hub, which there's a link in the chat right now but you're also already if you've registered for this you are on an email list to receive this recording as soon as it becomes available after editing because we hope you can take this information with you either yourselves to live greater or help somebody you know that may be reaching out that can use this um, at a later time as well so yes please you guys uh we're, we'll welcome you to chat and thank you again danielle it's been fantastic
It's my pleasure. I, I love doing this stuff. Um, you know, it, it really is a passion of mine to like, like I said, I use, I used my example of the borrower last year, but like, it really is a passion for me to help people get into those homes. And again, remembering that we want you to own the home and not the home to own you. So, um, I just the, those happy smiles in front of the houses, you know, when they, they finally make it is just, it, it's what, um, it brings me here. joy. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so speaking of first time home buyer, I'm, I, and I love that you speak with such passion about this, but now we're all going. So where do we start? And we had a great question. Is it reasonable to start with that pre-qualification as a first step? Absolutely. That's exactly what you want to do is your first thing is you're going to, you know, call me or you're going to email me and say, all right, Danielle, what do you need from me so we can get the, the, the pre-approval process started? And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fill out an application. So we're going to, you know, tell me where you work, tell me where you live, tell me how long you've been at your job. So we're going to fill out that application and then we're going to get that documentation. And then that really then the loan application process with the supporting documentation is what allows me to generate that pre-approval. And even if it's just at, in the preliminary stages where you want to ask questions, I, you know, I think I'm about here. I, this is what I'm doing to make the necessary steps. I'm not quite there yet. What, what other suggestions do you have for me? And we can talk about your individual um, situations, you know, and, and guide you to getting that pre-approval letter. That is fantastic. And I think these just roll right in. It's kind of crazy <laughs> how it works, but we, somebody asked, can you talk a little bit about the players in the room, right? What to expect after you pre-approve um, or what it takes to get to pre-approval. So yes, that paperwork. Um, and I guess to talk a, bit, a little bit about that, that players in the room, who should you talk with first? So, so typically, if you go to a real estate agent first, the first thing they're going to ask you is, have you, have you spoken with a lender? So that's, that's going to be the first question because a real estate agent isn't going to want to um, put you in their car and show you a bunch of property for eight hours only to find out that you don't qualify for the properties you're looking at. So the first stop is to um, get your, have your pre-approval letter. Then if you don't know an agent, I've worked with lots of them in my years and there's lots of good ones out there that I can refer you to. And then having that warm handoff. Hi, Mr. Realtor, you are working with um, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, my borrowers, and I have pre-qualified them and they are solid. And so th that's sort of what the players in the room are. And then of course you gotta go and find the property. Um, and what I'm seeing, and again, this is more of my real estate hat, um, with the moratorium on um, evictions being lifted come June 1st, I think we're going to see some inventory hitting the market come August. The reason I think that is I think that um, landlords are going to be tired of holding on to their properties and I think they're going to sell them. So we're going to I think we're going to see some turnover. We're already seeing some slowing in the market where we're seeing um, more listings come on the market and days on market become longer. So I think that we're going to be able to get our first time home buyers into houses where it's been a bit of a struggle in the last couple of months. Yeah, I really do believe that. that. Is Great, great news. That's so exciting to see here. And I love how you said that. It makes sense to start with that pre-approval going back to that previous question, because then you're not trying on homes that we can't afford. Yes. Um, last question for you. So now for those that are ready to get pre-approved, yes, go for it. But maybe about how those, if they're not ready to um, maybe start and they need to start cleaning up some credit, can lenders help with that as well? Absolutely. So um, one of the things is, is in order to help with that, um, there is a resource where you can get a copy of your credit report. It is called annualcreditreport.com. And it is the only resource where you can get a free copy of your Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax um, credit ratings. So if you go to annualcreditreport.com, you get a copy of your credit report um, because that's where I'm going to have to start. In order to clean up credit, I need to see what's on that. And we don't want to get a hard inquiry if we're trying to clean up our credit. 
So you can download that and then give me a call and say, hey, I've got a copy of my credit report. Can we, can I talk to you about what's on here and what steps I can take to get in a position to get pre-approved? Absolutely. Thank you so much. I think that is all the questions for now. You guys will have resources coming out to you and I'll hand it back to Michelle for um, a wrap up. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you, Danielle. My pleasure. Thanks hey. for having me. I apologize oh, to interrupt you. here. I was actually hoping to uh, add a few questions if you have a moment. Yeah. Hey, uh, re regarding your discussion of that 43% debt to income ratio uh, near the beginning there, um, yes. just, just on a personal note, would you find it to be a, a safer idea, again, going back to that, you know, own the property, not the property own you? I look at my 43% debt to income based on, on my needs in order to, to build in that, that safety per precaution on my side, or is, am I, should I feel confident in building that 43% debt to income off of my gross? So we, we do use gross income, and again, we're going to walk you through. So this is what 43% looks like based on your application. This is where your house payment's gonna be. So we're gonna back you sort of, I guess, backwards into, hey, this is where 43% is based on a purchase price and interest rate. And then, you know, can we, do we have wiggle room? What does that look like? And then are you comfortable with that payment? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. In that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, no, I feel I feel very comfortable with that. Thank you. Okay. I do have another I'd like to add if there's no other question. Please, please do so. Um, currently, I uh, the job I work at, a lot of the, the actual money that I make comes through overtime. Um, and I have a a pretty long history of about four years of working a consistent amount of overtime. And I wondered how that affects my application process in this case. It, that is such a great question. Um, thank you for asking that. So overtime is something that we can count if you have been getting it for over two years consistently. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at your W-2s and we're gonna take an average of that commission outside of your wages. So we're going to factor your wages as one piece of your income. And then as long as I have a two year history of those commissions, then we can average those out. We're going to average out those commissions if they're going up on a consistent basis. Um, commissions and or overtime. Sorry, you did say overtime and overtime is just like commissions. We're going to average that out um, and we can use that as income as long as we have a two year history. Excellent. Okay. I appreciate you breaking that down for me. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. In addition to that, excuse me to interrupt again. I'm so glad people are interacting though. How about commission? Is commission the same? Same, same as overtime. And I'm sorry, I, I immediately took overtime as commission, but we treat them the same. So yes. Now one small I factor, again, you, you mentioned earlier in your presentation there, um, regard, uh, regarding the, the different loan styles between the conventional, the government, and uh, the jumbo, um, I noticed that the, the conventional kind of pops out at right about what the median home price in Reno is, uh, plus or minus. So, so if, if we don't quite have a full 20% down payment, but we are, are potentially interested in looking at something that might be just beyond that amount, uh, what does that really look like? So, so one of the things um that that 548 to 50 is put out by fannie mae at the beginning of every year okay and it just so happens that our reno home prices have gone skyrocketing so there are again ways if you don't quite have that 20 percent, there's always the gift option okay um we can also look as if, if you haven't owned property in the last three years we can look at grant options, but you also, in, in looking at those grant options, you can only make so much um, in order to get that assistance. So, so we would, this would be a one-off, I think, on a, your specific situation that we could sit down and, and, you know, sharpen our pencils and try and figure out 
Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into that. Okay, understood. Then in that case, I'd, I'd, I'd reserve that time to just speak with you and, and, and when the time comes. So thank you for that. Absolutely. Okay, do we have any other questions going on? This is awesome and amazing. Um, I totally enjoy everybody's questions and some that I didn't even know I should be asking. So thank you to all that have been asking questions. Um, with that being said, uh, thank you, Danielle. And My to pleasure. those that are attending our Greater Financial Wellness Series, uh, for those that would like more information from Danielle, we will be sending out a follow-up email with the survey and Danielle's contact information. If you're interested in learning more about these webinars, please check out our website at gncu.org and search for Greater Financial Wellness Hub. And thank you all for attending. Thank you. Have, make thank it a great day. <laughs>